morning, everyone. How are you all this morning? Doing all right? Well, we're going to, let's get a little warmed up this morning. Let's stand to your feet this morning. We're going to worship the Lord together. I'm going to start off with one that we can just kind of shake the cobwebs off and let that caffeine set in a little bit. I need it too. <laughs> Oh, man, I am so excited. Y'all may be seated. Oh, man, it's been a great weekend. If y'all were here uh, Friday night for Not to Shine, just give yourself a round of applause, okay? Give yourself a round of applause. Y'all made it. Y'all made lifetime memories for those guys that showed up here, and we loved on those. It wasn't perfect. It was our first time. I know that everybody has a suggestion of what we can do different next year, and that's great. It'll be twice as good next year, but it was wonderful, wasn't it? It was a lot of fun. And uh, hats off to Amanda Tillery. She shortened her life by about three years by doing this. 
All right, but guess what? It's not too late to be a part of the event this year. Because right after church today, we're going to go over there and take all those curtains down and put all the chairs up. Thank you. Appreciate that. I've been doing this. This ain't my first time to do announcements. Um, so, yeah, as soon as, as soon as we're done with church, we're going to go over there. It won't take us long, especially if we can get about 10 of us over there. It will not take long to get all that down. I would just, we, it's already swept. The floors are clean. We just got to take the curtains down and get the chairs up ready for basketball this week, okay? All right. So, next week week, the 16th, which is Saturday, uh, if you're interested in worship team or being a part of the worship team or supporting the worship team, uh, being on stage or whatever your talent is as far as worship is concerned, please come to the Fire Arts House, and I don't know where they live, but they do, so get a hold of them uh, during the BRB, and, uh, and it's going to be uh, Saturday at 6 p.m., is that right? Saturday at 6 p.m. at the Firehawk House, okay? So just be over there and and then and be a part of that. They're gonna they're going to head up and kind of get some kind of organization around around the worship team, which is gonna be awesome. Give these guys a break so they can learn some new songs. Sometimes you lead from the front. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, the, tw- the 23rd is Men Like Mountains. That's a Saturday, and it's going to be 10 bucks. Come, bring people with you. Bring teenagers with you, uh, young men. This is going to be a great experience. It's $10. You can pay at the door. Uh, we would like to get, if you, if you are coming, we would like to kind of get a count, uh, but you don't have to sign up. So we just want to make sure we have plenty of food for everybody. Uh, listen, this is, a, this is another one of those events that we're reaching out into the community. We've got uh, people coming from the way. We've got men and young men. Um, oh, no. We've got men coming and a young men's group coming from First Baptist Church. So um, it's going to be a great experience. That's going to be Saturday the 23rd. And also, I happen to know that the pastor is very excited for the sermon next week. He is, he's, it's called Providence. And he's excited to preach it. He, he's, he was telling me, I, can, can I bump Jimmy and do it today? And I said, no, Jimmy's all prepared. So next Sunday, we're going to get a great sermon from the pastor. Let's continue to worship. I wasn't going to bump you, Jimmy.
chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins now I'm no I 
we are no longer slaves to our sin. We're no longer slaves to the mistakes we've made in our past, Lord Jesus. We're no longer slaves to fear in the present, Lord God. We know that it's you who sits on the throne. You sit at the Father's right hand. And you provide all of our needs according to riches and glory. So whatever we're facing today, whatever we brought into this place today, we know that you, Lord Jesus, are the solution. And there's no need to fear. Can I get an amen? Amen. Praise Jesus. All right. At Bright Star Church, if this is your first time, we do a thing that we call BRB, and it stands for Be Right Back. And, and it's, and it's a, a great little time that we have together as a church family. This allows us to, to get to hug necks and shake hands, and we've got a corner back there that we call introvert, Introvert's Corner, so if you don't like talking to people, you can just go stand in the corner and stare at each other. Uh, but, but we like shaking hands and, uh, and introducing yourself to people that you may not know, okay? And if you haven't seen somebody for a while and you see them, and you, then go, go uh, say hello and, uh, and welcome them here. So there's no such thing as a stranger at Bright Star Church. So you got seven minutes to go do what you need to do, visit, go grab coffee, go to the restroom, whatever. And when we come back, we're going to hear from God's word. Amen? We'll see you in a few.
I count on one thing The same God who never fails Will not fail me now He won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out He's working all things out And yes, I We're all uh, excited around here that we, for the first time since Bright Star Church started, uh, we've, got a, we've got a kids worship service going on, and uh, uh, it's for ages uh, pre-K or kindergarten through fourth grades, and we don't require that you do anything with your children here, okay? That's completely and totally up to mom and dad, whatever y'all want to do. I grew up sitting in the pew listening to my dad preach. I also was a kids pastor, and I had a kids worship service, and and you know we 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 had a great time doing that as well. So uh, that's entirely up to mom and dad. We just want to let y'all know that uh, that that's available, and uh, pretty excited to, to have that going on as well. As our Wednesday nights, uh, we've got volunteers who are heading up uh, our kids ministry here, and and that was something that I had always wanted to see kick off. And just in the last six months or so, we we're, were able to start. Uh, offering kids ministry on Wednesday nights to kids as well as our next up students which they've been doing that thing from the from the be very beginning from the first from the first Wednesday we started out with 20 you know 20 25 students showing up for Bible study on Wednesday nights which is really great so uh, man what a wonderful uh, event we had the other night uh, it was just amazing I got several texts that and just really confirming what what my what I was already thinking that that was one of the best things we've ever done as a church yeah <clears throat> to see uh, to see the kids um, have such fun together to get to make a big deal of them and make them feel so special and give them a place and then to give parents a place uh, we had uh, we had like a massage therapist in here who was giving moms and dads massages and things like that so I mean it was it was just all around an opportunity for us to love on uh, special needs families which has been part of our vision from the very beginning so I get so excited when I get to see the Lord working and, and uh, again we're going to do it bigger and better next year I'm thinking we may have to move it to the C uh, Civic Center in town next year and, and do it up real big so uh, so we want to invite you guys to just keep that in your, uh, on your prayer list and pray for it for next year and, and be ready to come volunteer because I promise you, you will get a blessing out of it. Amen. Well, uh, we've been kind of going through uh, a couple weeks ago on Vision Sunday. I shared the vision of the church and, and I introduced a whole long list of uh, leaders that we have in the church. And uh, some of these folks you know and you're around all the time, some of them speak often like Pastor Brad. 
uh, and then and some of you you don't really know they're kind of behind the scenes or they're they're serving in a way that's not quite so public uh, public and uh, in the case of uh, Jimmy we like to keep him out of the public so um, I already asked him if I could pick on him a little bit uh, so Jimmy is uh, Jimmy Lewis he's our head deacon and uh, he is not he was not chosen and asked to be deacon because we needed to fill a space, okay? Um, the reason God laid him on my heart is because Jimmy and, uh, and his wife Jennifer, they serve the community whether they were a part of a church or not. They're serving people. They're loving people. That's just who they are. That's just what they do because they feel called to do that. And so Jimmy has a deacon's heart. Biblically, the deacons are out there loving on families. They're, uh, they're, they're praying with the sick. They are uh, they're taking care of them, bringing meals to them. Uh, and, and Jimmy's probably going to share a little bit about his own personal testimony, so I don't want to steal your thunder, Jimmy. But uh, let me just give you a couple of things. You're not going to hear a message from a great uh, theologian this morning. Am I right, Jimmy? All right. So uh, if you want deep theology, come next week, okay, because uh, we'll dive into some of that. But what you're going to hear is uh, you're going to hear a man who loves the Lord and loves people and has been through some very, very trying things himself and come out on the other side with a heart to love on the, the kind of people who are dealing with the same thing that he dealt with. So would you all please give a warm welcome to my good friend, Jimmy Lucas. Well, as you heard, I am Jimmy Lucas. My wife is Jennifer. Uh, for those of you who have not met us, we are a deacon in the church. Uh, part of uh, what we do, uh, and, and we're going to be asking some of you to uh, join us as deacon families, and part of what we do is we, we feed people, we go to their homes unexpectedly sometimes, uh, but we've been there. We, we've had uh, instances in our life where people showed up to our house unexpectedly too. Uh, believe me, some of those times are the best times. Now, I'm here today to try to inspire you to do some of that. To see the church vision that Michael has laid out. Now, it, let me explain something else. My wife hates it when I public speak. <laughs> because I'll tell you why. I will set and change and change and change. And my daughter-in-law, thank God for her, she will rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And she has the patience of Job. Uh, but this time, I did not do that. I sat down and I wrote it myself. And I uh, decided that this is what y'all were going to get. And I really didn't finish it until this morning. So a lot of it is going to be read. And uh, a lot of it is heart-wrenching for me. Uh, I do have my... Uh, young son here so if it has to be finished I am going to ask him to finish it for me it's very emotional for me uh, and people ask me about public speaking in fact my own daughter asked me why do you do this and are you nervous now let me explain about being nervous when you're public speaking. Public speaking and being nervous are also the same chemical is released in your body when you're excited. And they did a, a, a scientific study on this. And the way they proved this is they had downhill skiers at the Olympics. Each and every one of them, when they came down the hill, 
they stopped. First reporter to interview them was the person who's doing the experiment. Only question he asked them, ask him one question. Were you nervous? Every single one of them, 100% said, no, I was excited. So when sometimes when you when you're when you're put in a position to try to speak to somebody you are given this chemical release and you think you're nervous but really you're excited now can you imagine sitting on a plane turbulence and the plane's rocking and you're going down and you're saying they're going boy I'm excited <laughs> I'm about to die with 150 strangers but I'm excited no, no, you, you're nervous. You're nervous, trust me. But, but, and Mike can tell you this too. Brad, anybody who gets up here is willing to get up here. There is, there is that feeling of nervous. But if, if you're like these skiers and you can actually train and tell your mind, I'm not nervous, I'm excited. I'm excited to tell these people my story. I'm excited to tell these people other people's stories. Okay, and we're going to do a little bit of that today too. I want to tell you quickly how we became members at Bright Star. I, uh, me and Jennifer had gone out to eat, and we we were going to a church, and we stopped going, and we began to cook a breakfast. We served this breakfast at nine o'clock in the morning, and it kind of made it hard for us to go to church, and we didn't want to give up that breakfast. So we were, we were out to eat, and here comes this handsome gentleman and this beautiful woman. And they come in. They come through the line. It's a new restaurant in town. We had a table. There was no place for people to sit, but there was two chairs in front of us. And I looked around. I asked Jennifer, I said, where is those people going to sit? She said, I don't know. Why don't you go ask them to sit with us? I get to be the awkward one. <laughs> because I'm not nervous. I'm excited. <laughs> so I go over and I ask these people. Now keep in mind I said that they were handsome and beautiful. And it was Brad and Faith McFadden. <laughs> they sat with us. And we discovered while we were sitting there together that we went to the same church. And we didn't even know it. We didn't even know that we went to the same church. After that dinner, we exchanged Facebooks. I mean, everybody would. We just had dinner together. It was a Facebook post from Brad McFadden that said they were, they were meeting Bright Star Church down at the coffee shop at 11 o'clock. It was perfect for us. We could finish up breakfast, clean up, run everybody out of our house, and then go to church. It was perfect for us. So I decided that Sunday I would go to church. Now, for whatever reason, I can't remember if Jennifer was ill or if she would worked the night before. She didn't go. I went alone. And I came back nervous, excited, actually. But y'all don't know the difference because I, I haven't told y'all the difference, but I was excited when I came back from that church. And I told Jennifer, I said, this is going to be our church. So we came in the coffee shop, 10 people, 12 people, 15 people. And then it grew. If y'all if are here from that church, if you were going there, raise your hand. Yeah. What people ain't kin to us or Michael, or kin to the tiller. And that's just about <laughs> it. So, yeah. So, and then we moved. We moved a couple of times. And then we finally found our permanent home here. Leadership in the church. It belongs to a great number of people. And I think I speak for the church when I say this is not Michael's pulpit. This pulpit belongs to the church. And if you have something that's on your heart, like I did today, you need to share it. 
Now, how this came about today, and look at her leaving. <laughs> this was actually my daughter's fault. <laughs> because I had promised myself I would never speak publicly again. I had actually promised that to a couple of people. And my daughter sent me a video. And the video is made by Chad Hymas, if any of y'all know him. He, he, he's in a wheelchair, and he's an inspirational speaker. And she said, Dad, you gotta sit, you got to watch this. You have, you have to watch it. This guy's like you. You have to watch it. So I watched it, and I thought, you know, me and Michael have talked a couple of times about me speaking at church. But I've made that promise that I wouldn't do it again. So I thought long and hard about it. I prayed about it. I cried about it. And I decided that I would do it one more time. My church deserves to hear this story. Now, Mike did an excellent job of showing you the vision for the church. A vision always comes with words. You just associate what you hear, and you can see the vision. And when you see the vision, and it's clear to you, it's much more easy to execute. If, if you were in a room, and I, I put you here, and I said, go to that corner. You're walking to that corner, and I put a chair in front of you, you'll go around that chair to that corner. But if I put you in the same room and I say, go to a corner, and you say, what corner? I say, I don't know, whatever corner you want to go to. And you start towards a corner, and I put a chair in front of you then, you know what happens? You'll stop. Because you haven't been given a vision, no destination. So you'll stop. And that's what happens with churches. There's nobody given a clear vision. And that's why the vision that he delivers is so important to this church. Because without it, the devil throws the chair out, guess what happens? You stop. If you've got a vision, and you're working towards something, when, when visitors come, even, even if this is not your job, but this is something you do, you leave here with a fulfilling inside of you, that can't be taken away. And that is when you greet these visitors and you have a fulfilling, a purpose of being here, then the vision becomes real to you. It's not just words that Michael's spoken. It becomes very clear. There is your corner. Now, I don't mean that literally, but... But that is, that's your corner, and you go to it. No matter what's thrown in front of you, you're still going to continue to go to that corner. People are different. Even me and Nanny. Now, many of you here know already, if you, if you say Paul, you're talking to me. I don't, care, I don't care who you're talking to, you're talking to me. If you say nanny, you're talking to Jennifer. That, that, those are our names, and that's just that's how it is. So even me and nanny are different in, in the respect of the vision. Nanny and I love beer. It's true. <laughs> this is true. We love beer. I... I actually don't think that we love the beer as much as we do the experience of going to the places, the breweries, and talking to people. Because w once you're set down with somebody and you have a common interest, the beer. <laughs> they, they're totally different people. You could meet the same people at Walmart and not, not have a common interest and they wouldn't give you the time of day. But all of a sudden, they'll tell you their whole life story. So we have a common interest. But if there was a sign that said free beer, 
and we're walking by. And Jennifer goes, look, free beer. And I'm like, look at the line. And she's like, I don't care, it's free beer. I mean, there's two totally different people right there that get the vision differently. Jennifer can only see the destination, the vision. I see the obstacle. And that's the way I am. I, just, I can't change that. Jennifer can't change how she is. She always sees the destination and the vision. I see the obstacle. Oh, there, there's a nice car. Yeah, but look, the tires ain't any good. You know, the tires are bad. So it, you, you have to grasp and hold on to the vision of the church. The vision of this church is to grow and to serve people. A hundred percent of what we do here is human related. It's not about the building. It's not about a bus. It's, it's, it's not about the piano. It's not, it's, it's not about the guitars. It's about serving people. And maybe Kylie will recognize this, but whenever, when you get to heaven, think about if God asked to see your hands and if they're not dirty from serving other people, I'm afraid you're going to be in trouble. Because God wants us to serve other people. Serving other people creates awkward moments. Awkward moments are, are, are hard. Uh, you know, I saw Tony two weeks ago. She approached a man back here that I had not seen at our church before. And I could hear the conversation. How'd you get here? Where'd you, where'd you learn about us? What do you know about us? Do you know this about us? What do you do for a living? A lot of different questions that I'm sure was awkward for her. Maybe awkward for him. But through the course of that, the awkwardness is broken. And this man really learns what our church is about. Mike Simmons. Why did you come to this church? And why did you come back? There you go. See? Be awkward. Isn't that right, Kylie? Be awkward. We collectively, Nanny and myself, has survived our moments of tragedy. Our faith has been tossed up and down like a yo-yo. We always came out the other side better people. It, you know, God... God made it so where everything beautiful, everything worth having, and everything good is on the other side of fear. Why he did that, I do not know. But every single time that we feared something, we had motorcycle accidents. Kylie had an accident, had to be flown to Tyler in a helicopter. We had cancer we had to deal with. Every single time that we came out of that, we came out of it because of God. And fear is all that we could think about until we came out of it, and then there was something beautiful. 
I can promise you, I would have never been right here had it not been for cancer. I distinctly remember the first event that I was asked to speak at. Probably drove Jennifer and my daughter-in-law, Wesley, crazy with these speeches and these ideas. And you can't say that. You don't, you know. So, so I'm sure, I'm sure when we came out of the other side of that one, my whole family saw something beautiful. Even though my daughter-in-law and myself are passing these emails back and forth, back and forth. I can promise you as she read some of my ideas and some of the things I had written, she thought that is beautiful. But he is scared to death. And I was at that time. I, I was scared to get up in front of people and, and speak. These are very difficult times that I'm about to speak about. First, sometime after my cancer tumor was removed, and I'm only going to talk about the cancer today. If we talked about the motorcycle accident, blah, 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 it would just go on and on and on. I'm going to talk about cancer today. I wore a bag, if you will. The medical term is an ileostomy. My new friend was literally glued to my side. It was not pleasant. I remember one day I was inside of Walmart. And I promised some of you here today that nobody has ever heard some of these things today. And you haven't. I was inside of Walmart, and I had to empty my little friend. Upon entering the bathroom, as I hurried by, I saw a young African-American man in the restroom. Me and him were the only two in there. I knelt in front of the toilet, as I always did, to empty my bag. I began to vomit violently. I was taking chemo. And I began to vomit. And I hear a knock on the door. And this young man's voice says, can I help you? And I was like, no, please, just go away. He said, you don't understand, mister. My grandmother has what you have right now. I know how to deal with it. I deal with hers every day. So I thought, you know, I better open the door because this guy's not going to go away. He, he may, in fact, crawl under. <laughs> so I opened the door. And to my surprise, this young African-American boy is now inside the same stall with a Caucasian male helping him with his bag. All the while, I'm vomiting. And he asked me, are you okay for just a second? And I said, yes. And he leaves. And I thought, he's not coming back. But he did. And he came back with a young lady who had towels to help clean me up. I was working. I, at the time, I was a salesman for Coca-Cola. And this lady and this young man emptied my bag, cleaned me up, stood me up, and then this young lady asked, do you mind if we pray? The young man said, I think that we really need to pray. She led us in a, a beautiful prayer. I'll, I'll almost never forget it word for word. And we walked out of the bathroom joking that what happens in a Walmart bathroom stays <laughs> in a Walmart bathroom. <laughs> and you know, it was a funny thing because I got transferred to another area 
some time, and I, I went to see my two friends who work at Walmart. They work at the Walmart in Greenville, Texas. And we hugged and we hugged and we hugged. It was, you know, it was like one of, we were just going away, you know, and it, it wasn't like that. But in a way we were. It was kind of breaking that fulfillment bond. And if you join these deacon families, you will bond with families like that. These people, they trusted me, and I trusted them. We had a bond, and every single time I would see them, we didn't even have to speak, and I just got this feeling of fulfillment. And they did too. But I got transferred, and then all of a sudden I changed companies, and I'm right back in Greenville Walmart. The very first time I walk in there, the two people I see are my two friends. And again, the feeling comes back to me again. You will never, ever, ever forget that feeling of fulfillment when you serve others. Not only that. But the people you serve will have the same feeling. So you're, you're not the only one here. The people you serve will also have that feeling. This one is a little more rough. On January 18th, 2013, Nanny and I were in the DFW area. I don't even remember why. It was probably something insignificant. What does matter is that I took a phone call that day from a lady friend of mine who I had never known to cry. And she was crying. Jimmy. My two-year-old neighbor was just diagnosed with cancer. And they're in Dallas at a hospital. Will you please pray for them and help them? And I said, yes. We had a little more conversation where this young boy was located. I told Jennifer, who I just got through talking to, and she said, we have to go. God led us on a very awkward journey that day. We headed to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, I'm thinking the whole way there, how awkward is this going to be? A young boy with his parents, they were just told he has cancer. I get to the hospital. Me and Jennifer go up. I get to the door. Can't do it. Remember the corner. Jennifer can only see the vision, the destination. I can only see that there's going to be a two-year-old child on the other side of that door who just got told he has cancer. Jennifer urges me to knock. I knock on the door. And from this point, I think it's better told by the mother's own words. And I will read you a letter that that mother wrote to me. And I, 
I don't want you to think that this is about me. This is about that family and what becoming part of that family meant for me and Jennifer and to them. And it reads like this. Jimmy Lucas, I remember January 18th, 2013 was the day my world quit turning. That day we heard our two-year-old son had neuroblastoma. I sat there and told those doctors to give him some medicine so we could go home. That's when the doctors pulled up a seat and sat down. He said, I can't send him home. He has stage four cancer, and we need to move you to the cancer floor as soon as possible. I remember sitting in that room. It was so cold. It was a nightmare that I couldn't make go away. I wasn't alone in that room that day, but I sure felt like I was. More doctors and nurses came in soon after as I was still trying to process that drop kick to my heart news. I was lost, I was confused, and everything that hospital staff said went in one ear and out the other. They handed me charts, literature, books, graphs, stats, paperwork, names, numbers, pamphlets, binders, and percentages of survival if Dominic could finish all the treatment. As they rambled on and on, all I could register is that tiny face laying on the bed looking at me like he could feel the pain that was surrounding my heart but still telling me that he wasn't afraid. Dominic was never afraid. Dominic was my friend. I had many, many, many talks with Dominic and Dominic was never afraid. Even though he wasn't physically in my arms right then, we both knew we were holding each other from across the room as all the chaos was happening all around us. As all the staff continued to talk and go on and on, there was a knock on the door. I remember wiping my tears and turning around. The nurse opened the door, and there you and your wife stood. I had never met you before that day, but at that very moment, I felt as if I knew you for years. Nothing felt right. Nothing. But at that moment, something did. I needed you that day more than I can ever explain. I don't believe I heard one word those doctors said that day, but that soft knock on the door was loud and clear to me. I am forever grateful to you, Jimmy, that you loved us when you didn't have to. You reached out to us when we needed you, and the support you gave us that day was a precious gift that is forever treasured in my heart. That awkward phone call and that awkward drive and that knock on the door to me and Jen also meant the world. Some years later, I would deliver Dominic's eulogy. It was both heart and gut-wrenching to me. But I was happy to do it. My last visit with Dominic, I remember it very well. His mother was away doing some shopping, and Dominic was in the hospital. His grandmother as they always did, would corner up and talk to Nanny because Nanny's a nurse. And they would talk to Nanny and they would leave me out of it. They didn't want me to hear about Dominic. On this particular day, after a few minutes of visiting with Dominic, and his, before his grandmother had taken Nanny to the side, I told Jennifer, this is not good. And I could see in Jennifer's eyes that my fear was exactly right. It was not good. 
dominant motion for me to come to his bed, and I did, as I did a number of times. He wanted me to bend down, and I did, and he asked me to come closer. And he asked if I was saved, and I said, yes, Dominic. And then I asked Dominic the same, are you saved? And he said, yes, I am. I'll be waiting for you in heaven. That was the last words I spoke to my friend. To know my friend is in heaven. And my friend knew he would be in heaven and he was never afraid. Dominic was never afraid of death. Dominic taught me not to be afraid of death. Many times I thought or even wished I would die. But Dominic taught me not to be afraid because the most beautiful things are on the other side of that fear. And our goal here in the church, many people will say, is to fill seats. A full church is a good church. That's not our metric. That's not our measure of success. Our measure of success, remember this church started with 10 people, 15 people. It didn't matter. What mattered was is that the church served people. The church saw to it that if you were not saved, that you were afraid of death, that you would come and that would be taken care of for you. That's what this church does now. We, we just counted there's over 140 something people here. It's still the same core value. We serve people. Our objective, our metric is people. Now I have a very serious question. And nobody has to show your hands. You just, we, we just need, I just need you to think about this for a second. How many of you know the process in saving a soul. If you don't know that, that's our fault. That's on us as leaders of this church. If a bus wrecked right out there right now, 150 people, and there's not a person in this church that won't go to that bus. And if there's somebody in that bus, because I'll tell you, I was so terrified that Dominic was going to tell me that he was not saved and I was going to be asked to do it. And I didn't know how. I soon learned how. I can promise you that. Because I wasn't going to be put there again. If we go out there and there's a person laying there dying, are you going to know how? I'm going to tell you, you're going to wish you had known. Because you're the only thing you're the beautiful thing on the other side of that fear for that person. You're coming out of a church, they're going to expect us to know. They're going to expect us to do it. That's not a, that's not a good time to be nervous. That's not a good time to be awkward or be scared. How many of you watch, I think I'll have time for this. I'm going to be real quick about this one. How many of y'all watch Deadliest Catch? If you don't, 
if you don't, it's marvelous show. Me and Jennifer watch it all the time. I got the opportunity to see through my company, who sponsors Deadliest Catch. I got to see a scene that had never been seen before. This part of was actually seen, but what I'm going to tell you at the end was not seen. There was, and they would they wouldn't show it because of the nature of it, and I'll you, you can figure out why in your own mind later. But there was a scene where they have cameras on these boats. And this one, it's bad storm coming. This one boat is set. There's a boat just across from it. It does not have any cameras on it. It's not a camera boat. The camera boat is setting still. And this boat is still bringing in pots because the bad storm's coming. And they're rushing, trying to just get everything in and get settled so they can ride out the storm. Huge wave comes, and this man is climbing up the side of those pots to tie them down. And this captain in this boat where the cameras are can see this man. And the wave comes, and then he can't see the man. And this guy is freaked out. He is on the radio, man overboard, man overboard. He's yelling to his team. He turns his boat. The boat goes over. And here is this man in the water screaming, please save me. Please save me. And these guys lower their boom that picks up their crab pots. And they grab this guy out of the water and they pull him up. They strip his clothes off. They take him down below deck, cover him in blankets. This captain comes down and he grabs this young man like he's his own son. Now these are people who would lie, cheat, and steal to another boat just to get those crab. But he grabs this young man from another boat and is hugging him like he's his own son. Here is where it cuts it off on regular TV, but we got to see the whole footage because they wanted us to know it was a team building video where we're taught to, to build with team members even if we don't like them, basically. And sometimes the competitor is our friend. So he's hugging on this young man and when they, when they disengage this hug, the young man says, I thought I was going to die, and I haven't been saved. And here is this ship captain that says, I am a minister. Now, you've heard this ship captain bleeped out so many times. <laughs> it's an hour-long show. And 45 minutes of it was bleep if, it, if the camera was on this particular captain. But he is a minister. And at that moment, that doesn't matter. What does matter is that this young man, still in danger of dying because of hypothermia, needed to be saved. And this boat captain was the only one to do it. And he did it. And they prayed. All of these men who lived this rough, rough lifestyle prayed, and this young man who had been pulled out of that water was saved that day. And I ask you again, can you do it? I thought I was going to have to do it for Dominic. I went straight home that day and I watched every single video I read everything I could possibly find about saving a soul and I'll say this again it's not anybody in this room's fault it wasn't anybody at my church at that time's fault that I didn't know how it was my fault It was my fault. 
I had not told anybody that I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know the process. And I thought long and hard, I thought, you know, why don't, why don't I know this? Because I think of all the times that I've gone to church. That's never been taught in any church that I've ever been to. I think it ought to be taught in school. But it's not. I think very long and hard sometimes about my time with Dominic. I even have a saying about that time. And my kids have heard me say it. And that is to live your life by width, not by its length. Dominic did just that. And Dominic wants me to do just that. My friend Dominic is waiting for me in heaven and I can't wait to get there. The last thing I am going to tell you today me and Dominic's favorite Bible verse. We usually whispered it in each other's ear every time that we met. It was Luke 17, 19. Get up and go because of your faith. You are healed. I'm going to let Michael finish it for today. I thank you all for your time. be real transparent for a moment. Anytime somebody gets up here to speak, Jennifer, you think you're nervous? I, I'm not, Jimmy, I'm not excited, I'm nervous. <laughs> because I honestly, you know, sometimes, I, you know, I know people, I love them, and I don't, but I don't know what's going to be said. And as a shepherd, as a pastor, you know, uh, it's a scary thing sometimes right? But I want everybody to take a deep breath and then let out a sigh for a second because you can learn something really, really important this morning about how you can have an impact in your life on other people. Uh, I could be up here as a pastor and worry that Bright Star Church will be known as the church where the head deacon and his wife loves beer. Or we can look, why? But why is that? Why is it's her? <laughs> why do we allow things? We allow the imperfections of people in, and their lives to stop us in in doing what God's called us to do as the body of Christ. We somehow expect that when people walk through these doors, we're supposed to put on a front and we're supposed to look perfect and we wear our masks and, and we're afraid of what other people might think of us. They might find out that we like beer or they might find out, you know what I mean, that we cuss a little. I saw a shirt last night that said, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. Now, I'm not, and I'm not condoning anything. Look, we're free around here. You need to be free. You need to ask the Lord and, and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. And if the Lord tells you that something you're doing is wrong, then don't do it anymore. But if you have freedom in that, man, you know, Paul says, all things are permissible, but not all things are profitable. So that's between you and the Lord. But, but here's the larger point this morning. That you can allow your offense to keep you from doing, or your fear 
to keep you from doing what Jimmy was talking about this morning, from stepping out there and making a real difference in the lives of people who desperately need Jesus. They Bus wreck, great analogy. All around here, people's lives are a wreck. It's a wreck. They need Jesus. They need that answer in their lives. So don't you ever think that you, you are not allowed to come here or you won't be welcomed here because you're not good enough or you're not perfect enough. I will meet you right where you are. You are welcome in here and we will love on you and we will learn how to love other people together like a family does. You go behind my doors in my house. It is not the perfect place even though, you know, uh, we would love for people to think we've always got it all together at the branch house. Uh, we have our moments. But what the center of all that is, is Jesus and family. That's what the core of this church needs to be. Jesus and family. That we're willing to look beyond the things that before have maybe offended us a little bit. And we let those things fall by the wayside. And we keep the main thing, the main thing. We meet people in the middle of their fear. And we tell them that Jesus is the answer. We tell them that there's something beautiful on the other side of the storm. And we, somebody who's walked through that, that's why he could lead in that way because he walked through that. They walked through that. And they saw the Lord come through for them. As we sit here today and we close, I'd like, to, I'd like you to bow your heads. And maybe you're thinking about, man, I don't know if there's anything in my life that, I'm, that really I'm doing that... You know, that corner that Jimmy talked about, is, has the Lord led you to do anything? What is that one thing that God has led you to do for his kingdom to make a difference in the life of other people, to share the gospel? There's two things this morning I want you to walk out of this place with. This isn't, all, this isn't about emotion. This is about you looking at your life and saying, Lord, how can I serve you better and how can I serve other people better? No nonsense. Just, what would you have me do, Lord? I'm here. Send me. Tell me. Be clear with me. Number one, Lord, what would you have me do? Number two, do you know Jesus? Have you come to a place in your life where you've realized that you cannot do things on your own? There's no way that you can be who you want to be. You can get to where you want to go without Jesus in your life. Have you ever made him the Lord of your life? And if that's you this morning, you say, Pastor Mike, I've never done that. And I would like to know how to do that. If there's anybody in the room this morning, I'm not going to have you come forward. But I would like you to slip up your hand so I can see you and I can pray for you. Is there anybody in the room that says, I would like to make Jesus my Lord and Savior today? Is there anybody in the room this morning? I'm not going to go any, any longer until we get past that. Is there anybody in the room? Just, just high enough where I can see it. Well, then praise the Lord. Look, if you didn't raise your hand and you want to talk to me later, please, please talk to me later. The other question this morning, Lord, we come to you right now. And I ask, Lord, that you strip away all of the things in us that are, that are wrapped up in us. Get Michael Branch out of the way. Get, get ourselves out of the way our offenses and our expectations and all of the things that we project on Christianity and what we're, we think it's supposed to be. Take all that away and leave only you, Lord Jesus, your love and the truth of your word in our lives. We submit to the truth of your word. And we know, Lord, that sometimes it's messy. And we know, Lord, that sometimes it's ugly and sometimes it's awkward. But, Lord Jesus, we are willing to wade through the messy and the ugly and the awkward to get to you, to find you in that secret place, to be intimate with you and know you and know that you are there for us no matter what, that you will use us in spite of our imperfections, every one of us. Lord, make this a family, a real family with you at the center. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you all so much. I want to ask once again that you guys plan on being here next week. We're going to start a series where we're going to start going through uh, the Old Testament, some of the, the high points of the Old Testament. And what we're going to look at is God's plan throughout time and how God is leading uh, 
how he led his people in the Old Testament and how the New Testament fulfilled that and how you are a part of the story of the New Testament, okay? So we're going to learn all about that, and I don't know how many weeks it's going to be, but, but buckle up and bring your notebooks. Let's take notes. Let's learn together, and uh, it's going to be a great time. So I want to go ahead and let you guys go. Uh, just remember this, that right outside those doors is your mission field. You don't have to go to a third world country. You can go two blocks away and find somebody that needs love. Amen? All right. So y'all go be Jesus to the world. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Uh, remember, if you can, if you want to hang around for about 30, 45 minutes, we're going to go over to the gym and we're going to tear that stuff down and clean it up real quick and it shouldn't take long. Don't feel obligated if you can't. But if you can't, you're more than welcome to stay. We've got cookies. Now